Having been welding for a decade now, I feel like there are some things that I can share with you to really help up your game in regards to TIG welding, in particular in the area of pulse. So anyway, let's jump into this. <laughs> I see. That's bald the tip because it was AC. So that was probably a great example of check the settings of your welder before you start. DC TIG, that'll be better. Hey, that did a good job. Today, I'm really gonna focus on the power of pulse. This is the game changer, uh, particularly for this stuff, stainless steel. This is 1.5 millimeter. Don't ask me what that is in banana units, I don't know. This has terrible thermal conductivity. It really holds the heat in one spot. If this was aluminium and I welded down here, I would be getting burnt at this end of it, at the opposite end, because aluminium is a great conductor of heat, and this is the exact opposite. So of all the materials you'll ever weld, stainless steel is the worst. It will bow, it will buckle, because the heat just stays in one spot, and it expands and it contracts. So you just have to be prepared for that. It's not the end of the world. Pulse really helps negate doesn't get rid of it entirely, but helps to manage the distortion that is created from the heat. So that was 90 amps. What if I said that what would fix this is if I increase the amperage? That is a lot better. That, my friends, was welded at 150 amps. So, 90 amps and dog's breakfast, 150 amps, and that's what I would call a very respectable weld. And this is why I really want to champion the cause of pulse, <laughs> at least for this application. And the quicker you can bring this material to its melting point, the less heat you actually impart into it. It's a time frame thing. The longer you dwell in a spot trying to get it to melt, the longer you're pouring heat into the part, which is going to equal... Well, that. So the general rule of thumb when it comes to what amperage to run, it's about 40 amps per millimeter. This is 1.5 millimeter. I'm welding two pieces together. So let's say 60 amps for this. Why don't we try that? So textbook 60 amp weld, not bad, not great, not bad, and 130 amps on pulse. And well, I know which one I want. So let's just go through pulse and sort of give you the layman's terms of how I understand the function of it. So, so this is our pulse switch here. We have pulse, we are, we are no, we put that onto yes. It always gives a little beep to say, good on you, you made a change. When pulse welding, what you need to remember is that even though 150 amps seems like a lot for 1.5 millimeter stainless steel, the material is only going to experience that amperage for a split second or whatever you set it to. This machine lives on 150 amps because all I do is change the speed of the pulse and the duration of the pulse to affect the outcome of the weld. It really is that simple. How we uh, do that is we're gonna press the, the knob. Let's go through. This is our base pulse. This is preset at the factory and you basically don't have to worry about it. It sort of automatically goes up and down depending on what you're doing. This is the peak of the pulse. This is the power side. This is the rest side. 21, that's fine. The next is we have our hertz. And the easiest way to describe hertz is the speed of the pulse. The higher this number, the quicker the pulse. And for the most part, between 0.9 and 1.2 is a good range. Occasionally, if I'm welding something really thin, I'll jack that number right up to 33. And at that point, it sounds like, even though I'm in DC, I'm welding in AC. And that's a useful tool that, I, that Jody from Welding Tips and Tricks talks about. He calls it the rule of 33. 33 amps, 33 pulses per second with 33% background. Everything is 33, and that's a really useful trick. You can TIG weld razor blades together with that setting, no problem. That would be practically impossible to weld 
um, without using pulse and the rule of 33. So yeah, you can see that the very start of these where the I had a, it was just 24 amps um, and that was like the starting current, even that was 24 amps was too much and that was blowing through. But as soon as we moved into the pulse cycle, um, yeah, it just started working. <laughs> It's a cool trick, thanks Jody. So our hertz, this is our speed. The next is percentage. You're now setting how much of that pulse you're on the high side. What percentage of that 1.2 seconds you are on the blast. So the higher this number, the more power you're going to output. I live somewhere between 25 and 35. Uh, once you go over that number, 40, you start to cancel out any benefit that you get from using Pulse. You might as well just be welding in straight DC. The beauty of Pulse is that you're only ever on that high voltage for just a fraction of a second. Just boom, just enough to melt the filler wire and the base material together. And then you're back to the low amperage. And obviously, the quicker you're doing that, the less heat you're putting into the material. I just want to point out that our captain actually has a, an entire chart on the side of the welder that tells you good amps for whatever you're doing. So this is our starting amperage, 10 amps. When you press the button, this is where you start and then it's going to jump up to the peak current of your pulse. Actually, it's more straight up, but anyway, that's 150. So what we have here is a visual representation of what happens when you pulse weld. We have our starting amps when I start welding. For me, I'm on T4, so it's going to start 10 amps until I release the button. And then we kick into the pulse cycle, which is 1.2 hertz at 26%. So the 1.2 hertz is the time, it's the speed. If you had this set at 1 hertz, you would get one pulse cycle per second. 1.2 hertz is just a little bit quicker, and that's represented here. The 26% is how much of that cycle, starting here and ending here, is how much of that I spend on the peak current the high end. The rest of the time, it's going to be down here at 21 amps. That will just keep going until I press the button again, hold it, and that's going to dip me down to 10 amps. And I like to sit around for a little bit, depending on the circumstance, to just let the part cool down, shielded under gas, and then I'll let go and it'll be finished. So in a nutshell, that's what we're doing. You could spend your entire life on 150 amps, and all you'd ever have to do is change these two values, and you could pretty much weld anything. <laughs> it's not ideal. I'm not saying you should do that. I'm just saying it's possible. So to recap, your hertz is your speed which is how quick you're going to go between start and stop of each cycle. The percentage of the pulse is how much time you're going to spend on the hot end. This is, a, this is an acquired skill, it's something that you need to work at, but understanding this and knowing what each of those settings does should really help give you a good foundation. Um, when I'm welding 6 millimeter plate, you know, 12 millimeter stainless steel plate, lots of heavy welds, basically this machine stayed on like a 160 amp straight DC with 3.2 millimeter filler wire and we were just laying heat into it because that's what we needed to do to get the job done. You wouldn't even think about uh, pulse welding, heavy stuff like that. But when it comes to thin stuff where you don't want over penetration, this is where it's at. I wouldn't suggest starting to learn to TIG weld on stainless steel. One, because it's expensive and two, it's just a little bit tricky uh, until you've had a bit of time and practice with, with TIG welding. Uh, I would go, I would start with mild steel actually. It's really hard to screw up. <laughs> mild steel TIG welding. So let's quickly talk about gas. You want straight, pure, unadulterated argon when it comes to TIG welding. None of this MIG gas, it just won't work. Argon uh, has a special property in that it ionizes really well and helps to transfer the current through the gas, creating a very stable arc. Anything else just won't work. And in Australia, the land flowing with milk and Vegemite that gas bottle comes in a peacock blue color. So you can identify it just by the bottle. So let's talk about technique. If I could reduce everything down to one word that's gonna really help you, I would have to say it's stability. How stable you are is going to be the make or break in regards to your TIG welding results and how neat it all is. Because at the end of the day, the art of TIG welding is basically the ability to move very, very slowly, very, very precisely, very, very consistently. Really, all those things um, come into play, and the biggest help 
to do all of that is you being comfortable and your hand being well supported and stable. Which brings me to this point. That is that most people when I see start out TIG welding, they will hold the TIG torch like this. They will just grab that thing like a monkey grabs a banana and they think that's how you do it. And there is an application for this and that's called walking the cup where you need all of that articulation in your wrist to be able to walk that thing along. But what I found is that when you hold a torch like this, I've got really, I've got nothing to prop off unless I use this hand up here like this. And then I'm sort of forced to weld in a big circle. And then, hey, how do you add filler wire into that? And, uh, and I call it free balling. You're just out there, your arms are floating in the air and you're trying to, you know, when you're TIG welding, you're trying to maintain a very consistent arc gap. And what I mean by that is the distance between the tungsten and the work needs to be like no greater than the diameter of the tungsten itself. So this is a 2.4 millimeter tungsten. I don't want to be any further away than 2.4 millimeters. And I would say that even that is too far. And as anyone knows who's TIG welding, when you dip the tungsten, it's game over, man. You need to take that sucker out and regrind it because you're just not going to get the nice concentrated arc that you need. Uh, it's going to start fanning out. It's going, the, the arc is going to start to wander. It's not going to be pretty. It can be done, but you want this to stay clean. So how I would recommend holding the torch is kind of like a pull cue. Just rest your hand open like that and drop it in. Your thumb pinches it and this, the fingers up here support it. And this finger becomes the trigger finger. And what that allows you to do is you can now, you can prop your arm against the edge of the bench and you can very, and I mean, I'm wobbling a little bit here, but that's only because I've had 16 cups of coffee. You can move quite a long way in one position. It's comfortable. I'm not having to hold my hand up and rely on all of this part of my body to, be, to remain completely still. When I used to TIG weld like this, just breathing was enough to throw me off and to ruin the weld. So what this does is, is this brings all of your bodily movement just back to this one point, wherever you're propping. And that's just a much better way. So just like that. And uh, that is how I recommend most people TIG weld. Like I say, if you're walking the cup, grab that thing like a banana. Well, it's probably not even have you grab a banana, but anyway. I've just offended the banana grabbing society. You know, that's fine for that. But it's lousy for trying to weld along here. Unless you're kind of like dragging your hand or your knuckles or something. I'd highly recommend this. So what I just demonstrated was the whole, the mechanics of the movement during pulse. So I paused on the high and moved on the low. I paused on the high and, and that's, I only ever moved when it was on the low part of the, the base current. Another thing to take note of is how far you move forward. What I like to do is move nearly to the edge of the puddle and pause for the next pulse. That helps to give a really, to give a really consistent looking weld bead. Now I've exaggerated this with this setting. I basically slowed this machine down to its maximum slowness <laughs> to create that. The next most annoying thing when it comes to TIG welding uh, is tacking. This is where things can really go awry and actually Pulse is a great help here as well because like I talked about earlier, you can bring the metal up to temperature really quickly in a short period of time and just help to bridge the two pieces of material. So I've still got this set on tacking at all possible. If it is possible, you, and if you don't have filler wire, you don't want any gap between your two pieces. You want them to be touching. And, uh, and we'll just do this first tack without filler wire. Now this wasn't the straightest cut and there was quite a decent gap along here. When I put that tack there, that contracted so much that it actually pulled this end piece together. 
And so that's just something to keep in mind when tacking up work, is that each tack is going to pull this piece of metal together like a zipper. And in this case, it worked to my advantage, but sometimes it can, um, yeah, it can really wreck your day. So let's talk about adding filler wire to the whole situation. I found that holding the filler wire like this and with the torch at a, I don't know, 30 degree angle, all I have to do is come up and down to add filler. And I'll just move along. And because the angle of the filler wire is so low, I don't even need to feed this in. Basically, I'll be as I'm adding filler wire, it'll be consuming the wire at a really nice rate. And I'll just come along. Now, it's not as it's not as good as, as doing this sort of stuff. That's sort of um, that's really where it's at. But as a beginner and as just a, a really nice, simple way that allows you to just more concentrate on what you're doing with the torch hand. I found that this filler wire technique is a game changer. And that's basically what we, I'm just gonna go up and down, making sure I don't go too high with the filler wire. If I raise this up so far that it comes outside of the shielding gas, I'll be dragging contaminants back into the world. No doubt my brother will have sped that up in editing, but that was as slow as I could go to help demonstrate the, the mechanics of it. And going so slow, my timing was a bit out, but even so, we have a really nice consistent bead profile, meaning that I added about the same amount of filler wire for each weld. And all I had to do was wait for the pulse to go to the, the, the base current, the low side, move forward the same amount, and dip as the pulse was on high. And basically, the, the, the learning curve now is to go out and practice this. You need to sit down with some scrap and just start getting into the, the rhythm of it because pulse can be a bit unnerving at first. It can feel a bit, little bit like a runaway train. Uh, but once it's all sort of, once everything starts to gel and it starts to click and you sort of get those motor skills memorized, it becomes sort of second nature and you'll be able to produce welds like that. So Pulse gives you a unique ability to create a very nice and consistent bead profile. I find that the rhythm of the Pulse uh, helps me to sort of stagger my movement and just keeps everything more consistent. This is sort of the higher end of the Pulse. Uh, these are sort of stainless steel ball caps. This is a job that I'm currently doing and should probably be doing as opposed to making this video, but hey, priorities. And as you can see, Pulse is the game changer. I can do a nice job on straight DC, but I can do a nicer job when I utilize Pulse. And it really has a wide variety of applications. And I guess the last thing I need to mention is all of this knowledge now is good to have, but it's useless unless you put it into practice. So my encouragement for you is if you really want to get good at this, it's just going to take time. It's time in the helmet. That's what it boils down to. Practice, practice, practice. And, you know, I'm very fortunate. I've had jobs where I was paid to practice. I, and I was never happy with where, I'm, where I was at. And I'm still not happy with where I'm at. I'm always wanting to hone and refine the skills that I have and make them better. And I feel like that's really the attitude that you need to have to, be, to get good at this. You need to be very deliberate, very consistent in order to consistent in practice and um, in application in order to really get good at this. If you just want to weld on the weekend, man, that's fine too. You know, not, not everyone's going to be a welder for a living, but to have this skill is very useful. And if you enjoy what you do and you get paid to do it, that's sort of where I just feel very blessed and fortunate that that's what I do. And, you know, get yourself a decent machine.